Welcome to Making Sense of Alzheimer's. I'm editor Terry Casey, and I'm here today with Sky on Swings librettist Hannah Moscovich and Penn Memory Center co-director Dr. Jason Karlowish. Thanks for being here today. I got invited into writing opera by Len B. Beecher, who is the composer on Sky on Swings. And uh, I've only written three operas, and they're all with him. And that's my whole opera career. Was this your first opera that the topic was something, if you will, medical? 100 percent. Yeah. 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 What did you what was it like when you got the word we're going to do an opera about a woman with Alzheimer's disease? I don't know if I told you this, and I mean, this this will horrify you. Um, I, uh, it will horrify you. <laughs> My first reaction was, oh, no, is it going to be a lot of people in uh, white coats? Is that your idea? Let me because I'm, I'm going to be bad at that. Mm -hmm. um, um, partly because, you know, uh, I should say structurally, um, reporters and doctors are sometimes um, uh, devices that writers rely upon to get out exposition. Mm -hmm. And so I worry about using doctors and reporters in particular as characters unless they have personal lives and stakes in the story. Right. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So my first thought was, oh, Len Beat is trying to get me to write a bad opera with him. Yeah, about a bunch of doctors ex dis uh, disposing upon amyloid plaques and whatnot. And, yeah. You know, so yeah. my first reaction was like, well, Lambeat, I'll do it because it's you, but I don't like it. Yeah. But then what made you like it? Well, so then we had a workshop. Um, we, uh, Joanna Settle, the director, and Lambeat and I, they actually came up here to Nova Scotia to hang out with me. And we, we spent a couple of days talking about what we thought the opera could be. And then I thought, oh, OK, it's going to be good because there was an interest in speaking about the subjectivity of the experience of Alzheimer's, so from the point of view of people who have it, which yeah. opens up the possibility of creating a potentially surreal or fantastical world. Mm -hmm. And that was m more of interest to me because it felt like a place where fiction can, could go. Um, but then we also spent that time trying to, you know, at least have a layman's understanding of the biology of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we weren't just total rubes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is often what writers are, like there's a tendency to under-research, which is why it's so valuable to have expert consultants come in um, and tell us what we're doing badly, Yeah, which is usually a lot. Yeah, I'm curious, what were some of the things that you started with? So you all met in, uh, in um, uh, Nova Scotia and had these great ideas about what we're going to tell the subjectivity yeah. uh, experience of a person. Did you decide at that point it was going to be a woman, by the way? We did. We thought that um, that there would be value to it being a love story and that it being a love story between two women who both were at different stages of um, the development of their disease. Right. Um, and that they would fall in love, but we wouldn't be sure if it was Alzheimer's or love. <laughs> so I'm going to bracket the gender issue uh, around the love, but why didn't, uh, but, well, let's go there, actually. So why did you say it's going to be a woman and then another woman, why didn't you pick a man and another man or a man and a woman? Good question. Now I have to think back to that, <laughs> like what that decision was. Well, I think um, we were we were partly influenced, in th and this is perhaps, you know, not commendable, but we were partly influenced by the potential for it to be original because in opera there's so much heterosexual love like that's all opera more or less is it's just a tenor falls in love with a soprano and a bass gets angry about it that's like the whole canon right yeah. so i think we thought you know um we thought i mean and we all we all had came with personal reasons you know my sister's gay and married to her wife and i care a lot about her <laughs> and uh she uh, talks a lot about you know, who lesbians tend to be in stories and they're usually the villains and they're usually <laughs> serial killers. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm always sort of engaged in showing, um, you know, love between women um, when it's not actually the primary focus. So I'm always interested in that. Um, so this was like a perfect example, but I think that a perfect possibility for that. But I think also Joanna said it because she was like, 
you know, she sw swears a lot too. And she was like, you know, tired of the heterosexuality of the canon. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. No, interesting. So, um, so you all started out in Nova Scotia with this idea of the subjectivity of the experience is going to be the focus. Um, and then, you know, started writing, started researching. Um, and then eventually you came to Philadelphia, which is where we met. Um, yeah. And and continued on from there. I think when we met, you had about another probably nine months to go before it was going to premiere. So you had still had a, a bit of time. I was just curious along the way, uh, how did your kind of idea of what should be the elements of the narrative change? In other words, not so much what was true or false, but you know what were some of the assumptions you had? Or they said, no, actually, we're not going to do that. We're going to have her do this instead. Like that's a more true picture of the disease but i'm just curious what were some of those changes well i can speak specifically to um the point where you came into the project probably oh <laughs> um, yeah in fact i'd like to just make sure that we we take that in a couple of parts um i know you you two had a couple of conversations yeah. uh, separately leading up to the discussion with the creative team um so if you could just tell me a little bit about um, how you two had gotten connected. Uh, first of all, some of the discussions that you had uh, re reviewing the, the opera and then um, leading up to and including uh, Jason's visit to, to the creative team. Sure, well, I'll speak to how I got connected. I just got an email one day from someone from the opera that said, we're doing this opera. I think even then the title was Sky on Swings um, about Alzheimer's, would you be available to talk? It was as simple an email as that, and um, I'm like, sure, it sounds great. I was, I was, uh, uh, I, it was the first time, and I hope it's not the last that I got asked to consult on an opera about Alzheimer's. Um, but I knew right away, um, you know, that's a great topic for opera, um, as opposed to uh, a play or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a well plays, opera, you know, and I thought, what a perfect opera topic. So um, so I said, yes, right away. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, pedaled down to your, uh, to, to the uh, Philadelphia uh, 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 Opera down on Broad Street or so. That's how, that's that was how we met. <laughs> yeah, well, and we were, you know, it was sort of magical. I got told that, you know, um, one of the um, eminent, you know, just people out there who knows about Alzheimer's was going to be available to us. And for me, I'm always like, well, that's magic, first of all. So it felt like Opera Philadelphia magic that somehow. Yeah. And uh, and uh, then, you know, for us, like we're always, um, I, I mean, it's always like daunting to have somebody who actually knows anything come in because, you know, we've been Googling things, oh. um, <laughs> which is, you know, so we have like Wikipedia level knowledge so we think we know what we're doing to some degree, you know, and I've, you know, you've made whatever efforts to watch, to talk to, you know, so there's like the anecdotal route. So I've talked to people whose parents have had Alzheimer's or who has husbands or wives have had it. And I've watched some documentaries and read some novels and that's the limit, right? Um, and I've tried to get a, a handle on the biology, but to actually have someone there who has, you know, you know, expert, knowledge and who has you know um, who is a veteran at dealing with the disease that's something different so a bunch of things got said by you which were super useful for instance you know you talked about <laughs> i think we had references to the chorus being like zombies at that yes. point. and what i heard you say was oh, that's always how alzheimer's people get spoken about I thought I had made that up. Like I, I didn't know anybody had ever referred to Alzheimer's patients as being like zombies. I had, ne and I, and I thought I was brilliant, or at least I thought, you know, I thought, oh, like, you know, if this had a horror genre to it, it would be zombies, because there were so many zombies out there, zombie stories circulating, and I was like, oh, you know what, this reminds me of. Anyway, so hearing you say that, I was like, oh. Wow, like I did not know that that wasn't, you know, wholly original. So that was super useful. So then we took that out. And then we also, I think, you know, there were more specific, more technical things that you said that were helpful, like the 
the kind of hallucinations that we were um, we had in the uh, early scenes, and you know, we had a character who was seeing strangers, and you talked to us ab about how they wouldn't actually hallucinate a full person, but they might mistake one person for another. Yeah, uh, and that made sense. I I thought, oh right, okay, I get that. That that makes sense of like what it would technically be like, or or you know, for someone with the level of experience you had with people with Alzheimer's, that's what you typically see. So that was helpful too, and so we made changes based on that as well. And I think there were a number of things you said that were like that. I mean, it's very technical, right? But it is, uh, yeah, it was it was certainly I guess quote technical, and it's to say you know, you know what's there for every patient with Alzheimer's, there's a unique story about the disease, and we probably could go find someone who fit. Uh, the story you had, but I, it's interesting. It was trying to like, what's the normative story of Alzheimer's so that you're not letting an extreme drive the narrative and therefore, you know, because the ex whatever narrative you tell will become normative, you know, it'll become, oh, that everyone watches, oh, that's Alzheimer's being depicted. Um, so the tension I felt as I remember reading the libretto was, you know, I remember, for example, you had her pull a knife out and go after her daughter. Mm -hmm. and, I was, I went after that with a knife. <laughs> uh, and I have had patients who have gotten violent, but it's, but to the level of pulling knives out um, or guns, I mean, it's happened. I've had patients, I haven't had a patient use a gun, but I certainly, but it's not the norm, you know? Um, and I felt as I read that, that if you make that happen, then that tells a story that patients with Alzheimer's are violent to the point of drawing knives and going after people as a result of hallucinations. Right. Like I could, that exists, but that's like letting the, the, the 0.05 percent become the, 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 the median. And, and I kind of felt if, that now here I'm being directive, like no pun intended for your field, but mm -hmm. you know, the responsibility of art is to, to, to recognize that what you say will have a lot of implications. And I really felt like I didn't want to see a drama about Alzheimer's that opens and features a woman having vivid hallucinations that drive her to near homicidal behavior. Like that's just what the public would want, right? It confirms their worst fears, you know, but then you lose what really you wanted to tell, which was what's the experience of being human with the disease, not being a monster with the disease. Um, that's all so articulate. And it is true, I think that, um, I mean, obviously it is, but it's like such a beautiful articulation for me as a writer of like, you know, there are pitfalls to being a writer. I mean, the atypical stories tend to drive most of yeah. writing. Um, but no, I mean, I think like in this case, I wasn't even aware of what was typical versus atypical necessarily, right? Yeah. So, and I think actually in the case of Alzheimer's, um, the experience of it is extreme enough that you do not need to go towards the atypical or to put out anything that is, um, you know, um, misconstruing the disease and that might actually do a public's disservice. But, and, and so I don't know if you, I mean, obviously you're aware. So we took that to heart and I took that out. I know. I remember seeing the premiere, yeah. like life is gone, Terry. I, I said, but that is, you know, the great advantage of having, of having you come in is that then you can speak to us about what you know, which is a great deal more than what we know about the actual ex disease. Yeah, yeah. So it's always daunting when the expert consultant comes in because you're like, oh, I'm, gonna <laughs> I'm gonna have to rewrite things. But I think it's a great, you know, nine months out, you know, I think the worst for me, a worst case scenario is to hear that on opening night, so. Yeah, no, I, I hear you, yeah. yeah. It's like an editor, I guess. There, that, there's writers and there's editors, and there's truly a difference between the two. Although I don't think of myself as an editor of your piece. Well, that is absolutely like, you know, I mean, I, you know, having worked on, I, work, I worked on military shows and I had expert consultants come in who were, did tours in Panjwai, Afghanistan. You know, I worked on a show about theoretical physics and we had a, um, a guy from the Perimeter Institute who has a theoretical physicist. I mean, we need it because otherwise, and my parents are social scientists, so I feel a very strong atavistic desire to uh, research properly um, yeah. when I can. Um, I think I'm probably, I hold, it's, it's unusual. Writers are like, whatever. <laughs> a what lot of time. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm up again deadline and there's a real shoot schedule I will be like that too I'll be like mm, you know yeah yeah everything kind of goes out the window you're just like get something to the we have to shoot it make a movie but uh if I have the time I'm and I'm so delighted to be able to like not put out like not get it wrong like just obviously wrong you know and that that certainly helps in terms of of the writing um but that that meeting down in Opera Philadelphia was was with the, the whole cast and and it was uh really enjoyable to to see them tell their share their personal stories uh and and reflect upon uh both the feedback and and your explanation of some of your writing uh, what kind of conversations do you remember having with the, the cast? Uh, did any of them reflect upon that discussion as well? Uh, in addition to these changes in the writing, do you remember any changes being made and sort of how how the disease was being portrayed by the actors? Yeah, because I remember um, you spoke a little bit about like um, what the physicality was of Alzheimer's and that I know impacted choices that the performers were making around mm how they were going to physically portray those characters. That's my memory. I was awfully focused on myself, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to take good notes on what had happened. But I do remember that a lot of your insights into how people with it, who have the disease move and function in space yeah. were you know, listened to really carefully by um, all of the performers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting how your story, um, you know, you had to have, but you have to, but you know, you got family there, um, and uh, their suffering was there. I mean, there's the scene when the the daughter of the one patient and the son of the other meet um, in the I think the TV room or something of the uh, of the place, the facility, um, and then they have their moment. And it's actually um, there. It's 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 vaguely uh, I don't want to say romantic, but it could be standard. You know romance but you batted away like it's not gonna they're actually very sad characters they're uh the two of them uh uh but they're not foregrounded they don't drive at all the narrative um it the scenes with them i don't mean to be critical but like but but you could have cut them out and it still would have worked i i think I, um i'm curious why you even had them in there well you know i think part of so it's so interesting right like Part of what I, when I looked at the body of like the literature and fiction and uh, about Alzheimer's, like what's out there that I could find, a lot of it focuses on the family members of the people with Alzheimer's, and that makes sense, right? Because their experiences, there those are people who share a reality, um, and so focusing on them and their grief, which is often extreme, um, makes sense. Uh, in terms of what I know about how to tell stories. Um, but because of that, that it felt to us like um, sidelining or marginalizing that experience was more interesting and foregrounding the experience of the people who had Alzheimer's was more interesting or more original or less done, less part of what yeah. um, fiction tends to address. And so I think that's partly why like that that was a consideration for us that so much of literature, anything, you know, any story around Alzheimer's foregrounds relatives, which, you know, and we just felt like, what about- and ask them what it was like. It's hard at the end to ask the patient, well, what was this all like? Because A, by then many of them can't really tell you and B, or they're dead. Yeah. Uh, so you took a lot of risks there, actually. We did. Yeah. In that scene though, where the, 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 the two uh, adult children are together, I remember there's a um, audio track of contemporary news reportage from America. Uh, mostly, I think it was, yeah, like the budget agreements and whatnot. And this might not have been your doing, but I'm curious. Could you give any insight about what the logic of what was the what was what what how was that moving the narrative along, or what was the thought around having this the cacophony of news reporting going on? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, that is, you know, that's sort of not my department, but I can speak to it. <laughs> I can tell you why Joanna made that choice directorially. I think, you know, they were interested because we sort of had those scenes partly there. Like, 
part of what we were up to was trying to, you know, because we were sort of taking off into a bit more of a surreal world with the the women who were at the center of the story, then we wanted scenes that were going to ground it in a real kind of like gritty reality um, that would counterpoint for us. And that scene, like the idea of like just budgets, I know it was her idea of counterpointing so that like suddenly we're crashed into like a waiting room and there's just crappy budgets, you know. Originally they were trying to get clips from The View actually. Um, they wanted uh, The View, yeah. but they didn't get that because it was a million dollars. So wow. they got budgets because they thought they wanted just something that was just like, this sort of stark like fluorescently lit reality of that was the opposite of what was going on in the other story interesting yeah yeah very interesting the um uh uh you've been using the word surreal a lot i'm curious when did that enter into the conversation about this as a way to organize what this was about well and like here's where we took a real imaginative leap and we weren't sure how people would feel about it honestly um, um but because there's the, because the interiority of the experience of Alzheimer's, it's hard to know, right? Like, or so it seems like we, we can look at the exterior behavior of people who have Alzheimer's and, and try and like make some guesses, but in a weird way, it's a place fiction can go, um, which is like, what is going on? And I think that the world we imagined was surreal in the true sense, like dreamlike. Yeah. The, um, you know, it's interesting. There's a, uh, a uh, short story by uh, another great Canadian writer, Alice Munro. Um, oh, I know which one, yeah. Called uh, Inside of the Lake. Yeah. Uh, you know that one? It's brilliant, yeah. yeah. I teach that uh, story, and I always emphasize to the students, you've got to read this in one sitting. You know, you sit down and budget the 35 minutes it'll take from beginning to end. Um, because that, that, that reminded me of, of, of your piece or your piece reminds me of it which is the experience of i forget her name and story but you know entering into this world of a you know kid going backwards on a bicycle um in a garden unsure of uh, uh, uh what it is uh a broken clock that's right two times you know there's a whole host of uh, uh scenes in that and and the general uh, uh imagery of, of inside a lake is, is surreality and I think Monroe got it just right like you guys did you, you could either try to make it weirdly real in a comic sense then you know um, or you can make it a horror story unreal scary or you can do what I think is 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 the right space which is this above reality beyond reality or surreality and, and I, I think you guys got it with, 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 with that yeah that's kind of you yeah, I love Alice Munro, and obviously she's influenced me a huge amount. She's, you know. Yeah, it's interesting how much her stories are about aging, uh, it, uh, particularly aging women. Um, it's, it's, it's actually almost an organizing theme of her work, uh, which is time uh, and the passage of time and how it uh, affects lives. Um, and certainly aging it features there. Uh, there's a couple of her stories where someone's got cognitive problems, um, uh, as a as a, 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 a bear, the bear came over the mountain. The other one, of course, yeah. uh, she's got a few. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. She really go, you know, she goes right for and sort of hunts down the experience of Alzheimer's for all of those involved. Yeah. Back to the to the conversation we had also about the uh, the romance between them. I thought I, as I watched it and and, and uh, read the libretto. Um, I thought it was really um, uh, interesting that that was presented as a matter of fact and not as a problem. Um, because in clinical practice, of course, that often is a big problem. Like, you know, we don't want them to be a couple or is this acceptable or should we tell the children? And I mean, you could have had the whole thing be about the acceptability of their relationship. And you could have run the narrative that way if you wanted, you know, and made a drama. Yeah, you know, like back to in Madame Butterfly, you know, um, this, yeah. this Japanese prince shows up and is protesting and wants to marry Madame Butterfly, you know, and whatnot, instead of why are you hooked up with the American uh, naval officer who's basically uh, uh, jilted you. Um, but you didn't have a, a prince, if you will, show up and protest the relationship and whatnot. 
instead I thought it was interesting. You just let it happen and it was part of the story. Um, and, and, and it wasn't part of the problem. And in that sense, I think, uh, that what you did was something that kind of provoked the audience, you know, because the standard would have been to have the daughter march in and say, my mother would never have hooked up with another woman. You know, this is insulting, you know, or, or, you know, there's actually a husband at home if he knew about that. You know what I'm trying to say? You, you could have thrown that in and, and you didn't do it. And, uh, and I think, um, I, I think that actually by what didn't happen more so than what happened really reaffirmed that they're just, they're adults making choices. And this is the current choice they've made about a romantic relationship. Um, and, 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 and so I, I thought that worked very well you know, for what you didn't do more so than what you did. You know. Oh, well, thank you. And, uh, you know, on a structural level, I mean, Alzheimer's was the antagonist. Yeah. So we didn't need any other source of antagonism from family. Um, but again, I think also it was our interest to, to um, just have that be a part of this, this story and feeling like we may culturally be at the moment where that's possible we hope yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we no. can tell that story without that being foregrounded. You yeah. Know? No. Again, in the hands of, I think a more, uh, cliched writer, you would have had the daughter come in angry about the relationship or the son and had a little brouhaha about that and whatnot. Um, and that would satisfied a certain crowd and whatnot. You didn't do that. I thought that was really good. It worked well. Well, yeah. I'm trying to write things that my sister likes. <laughs> <laughs> I just try and make her happy. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I think also maybe I, it is possible too that it, you know, I know I do know what I'm doing. I was going to say, you know, maybe it's just really normative now and we're all used to it, but I actually think I did know what I was doing there. And I was consciously, I knew I was, I was up to something with not emphasizing it. Yeah. Well, from the Alzheimer's world, the story of someone who's in an institution, excuse the phrase, but it's to emphasize the authority of others and they're caring for them. Th that is a big issue when residents start to pair up and, um, you know, uh, uh, staff have all sorts of strong and opinions about what's right and wrong. Um, and you hear stories of family members who are furious. Why didn't you tell me? How could you let that happen? Et cetera. Um, and, and um, you made some choices, whether they were implicit or explicit, but what you, but you, you, you couldn't not make a statement by what you did. And, and I thought it was, it was very uh, well done. Um, well, thank was, you. I did the right statement. Okay. Thank you also for all of your help. You know, I think it, it must be a strange thing to walk into a room full of weird opera creatures like we are. And oh, we do it all the time here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but thank you, you know, like, we, you know, we really, you know, you hope for that. You really hope that you have someone come in like you did and help us to make it better. So that's like the best case scenario. So oh, yeah. do another one. Okay. The ideal. So thank you for that, you know, and for the help because yeah, we needed it. So. <laughs>